uh, history and review systems and complete exam are difficult to obtain, uh, especially in preverbal or uncooperative children. The differential diagnosis of pediatric uveitis is varies with age, with an overrepresentation really of um, infectious etiologies uh, in uh, younger children and pediatric specific masquerades. Can you think of, of one of them that you never want to miss? Anybody? Retinoblastoma. All right. Unique endogenous syndromes in kids. One has a name named after it. JIA, right? Juvenile idiopathic respiratory. And then atypical presentations of familiar syndromes in, in adult entities like pediatric sarcoid, which is a little bit different. Okay? And then of course, the choice and interpretation of laboratory tests. So certain tests may be, may be uh, physiologically abnormally elevated in a child like an angiotensin perverting enzyme. Okay, there are management challenges. The uh, onset of inflammation is insidious, chronic bilateral and asymptomatic. So children aren't gonna tell you that they have a problem. There's a frequent development of complications with the presentation with established ocular pathology is in itself a risk for the development of further complications and is also kind of testimony to the diagnostic delay and screening failure in many of these kids. And then of course, in children, you have the unique risk of amblyopia. Therapeutic challenges include the use of corticosteroids. So there's uh, systemic corticosteroids in particular will can result in growth retardation in children. And of course, there are the ocular complications that we're familiar with. Uh, and there's therapeutic timidity with respect to non steroidal immunomodulation. Um, and of course, the greater surgical risks that are inherent in kids uh, with exuberant inflammatory responses to surgery and the inherent complications of certain disease entities, such as JIA, which are have more surgical complications. You guys hopefully read about the epidemiology of this disease. I'm not gonna go over it in any kind of detail. It's about fourfold less common in adults, but that doesn't mean that it's not problematic. Uh, in a tertiary care setting, it can represent between two and 22% of uh, UVI's patients. There's a slight female predominance and it represents a large number of children in the United States, even larger globally. So the anatomic distribution of uveitis in a tertiary care setting, what do you think the most common anterior distribution is? The two most common for a pediatric disease. Acute anterior uveitis. Okay, anterior for sure. Anterior and intermediate uveitis with posterior and pan uveitis being less well represented. Similarly, in, in, in um, in a population-based studies, most of the things that people will see in, in general practice or out in the community will be anterior predominance. And in adults, things are similarly distributed. Um, there's, of course, referral bias, and depending upon where you are in the world, uh, as to you know, what entity you will see. What do you think the most common, quote, diagnosis in kids is? The most common diagnosis. Well, the most common diagnosis is, we don't know, idiopathic or undifferentiated disease uh, in about you know 50% of the time. Then the second most common is JAA and parsclinitis and then toxoplasmosis. Okay, structural complications certainly affect visual outcome. List two or three structural complications that could, be, that could affect visual outcome that might be common in kids with uh, pediatric uveitis, anybody. Cataract. They can have um, band keratopathy and other epitheliopathies. Right. Okay. Glaucoma. CME. What about in the, in the macula? Macular scar. Okay. A more common than that, maybe? CME. CME. Yeah, macular edema. Okay. So you've hit most of these in CNVM. So these. Uh, complications are, are directly related to the duration of uveitis as to be expected and the anatomic location of the disease, right? So with posterior and pan uveitis having more structural complications and then infectious etiology having a poor prognosis. Um, the visual outcome and uh, prognosis is, is very guarded in kids with uveitis uh, with visual impairment and severe visual loss occurring in a significant portion of the population with uh, unilateral lateral blindness occurring in a not insignificant proportion of patients, okay? Differential diagnosis, uh, 
non-infectious, anterior, what do you think? Just lifts off some entities. Okay. Okay. And you? Right. Kawasaki, early onset sarcoid, Blau syndrome. And we've gone over this pe pediatric intermediate uveitis, posterior uveitis represented by disease entities such as less commonly sarcoid, multifocal patients. And these are occurring in older children. Infectious anterior disease, what do you think the most common is? Same as in adults. Herpetic. Herpetic, right. Herpetic. Then Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis, you can see in, in children. And uh, something that post infectious autoimmune uveitis is more commonly seen in kids than in, uh, than in adults, or post vaccination uveitis. And of course, posterior disease, you have the congenital um, infections. Uh, and then I, they are listed here. And then, of course, you know, Bartonella and nematode associated disease, Lyme and endophthalmitis. And of course, we can't neglect the really important masquerade syndromes in kids such as retinoblastoma, leukemia, JXG, and trauma. We can also think about the differential diagnosis in terms of the age of presentation. I think this is semi-useful. Um, so infants, uh, zero to two years old, what kind of things are you gonna think about? What would this kind of a picture bring to your mind? What congenital infection might that ring a bell? I would think torch, like maybe rubella. Exactly, a torch, that's exactly what this is. So the torches, Toxo and other rubella, CMV, herpes, congenital syphilis, toxic paralysis, and retinoblastoma. Very good. Okay, then in older children between the ages of two and eight, the most common uh, cause of a uh, systemic cause of uveitis in children, uh, peak onset is around this age. What would that be, do you think? GIA would be a big one. You got it, right, okay. GIA, they're not gonna tell you that they have this entity, that's why they're screened. And then of course, these infectious and non-infectious etiologies and these uh, very unusual, but still uh, diseases that we see in our clinic, um, such as Muckle Wells and uh, Blau syndrome, middle juvenile granulomatosis. Then uh, in adolescence, we're approaching kind of disease entities that you might also see in adults such as the most common posterior segment disease, toxoplasmosis. It's gonna to also be a congenital disease, general infection, as you know, intermediate and parse planitis, B27 associated disease. And then of course, these white dots and um, post-infectious autoimmune type of disease. So let's just start out with a case, okay? This is a long case, but it's instructive because it shows you the kind of the course and uh, the many options that are associated with um, the, with JIA. Okay, so we're gonna, this is a kid uh, that I saw when I first got here and I saw him last year, finally, again. So in October of 2002, he presented in for initial evaluation of pediatric rheumatology and was diagnosed with oligoarticular JIA. Uh, it was ANA positive and was placed on methotrexate 10 milligrams. Uh, he was then presented to our clinic uh, on this dose of medication with inflammation in both his eyes, okay? bilateral anterior uveitis. The plan was to uh, put him on, treat his topical disease, and then what else do you think we could do for him? What, uh, what other thing could we modify in this person's plan? Well, it's on a systemic medication, right? So we could increase the methotrexate which we did to 15 milligrams a week orally. So the, the kind of generalized treatment paradigm. So I don't like to, you know, talk about algorithms so much in uveitis, but really more like treatment approaches because people think of algorithms as that's the way, to, the only way to do it, but really care must be individualized to the patient. So we start out with topical corticosteroids and then have a very low threshold to transition to steroid sparing immunomodulatory therapy because of the complications associated with both topical corticosteroids um, and long-term oral steroids. So oral steroids are used as a bridge sometimes with anti-metabolites um, or for very severe uh, inflammation. And then uh, 
the first line of the anti-metabolites, as we will see later, and then biological therapies. So I just want to mention that there was an important paper that was published uh, by Jen Thorne, uh, which showed that the risk of cataract development is lower in eyes. They're treated with chronic topical corticosteroids of less than equal to three drops per day. So this is important because um, there had been, you know, the dogma that, you know, no cells, no prisoners, but there are some, some children that really, no matter what you do, they have, you know, uh, 0 0.5 plus cells, or they require some topical steroids in order to keep them quiet. So this, this paper is important in that it showed that in patients that are on two drops or less, the risk of developing cataract, that is an important uh, complication, is, is pretty low. However, 60% of these patients required another, you know, systemic medication or biologic to control their uveitis. So this is not for consideration in patients with, for first-line treatment, but usually those patients that are on, already on systemic biological therapy. So some of them need kind of a suppressive dose, a drop or two a day of PEP 4K to keep them under control. That being said, um, I, the, the goal is to get them off of steroids completely. And I attempt to do that in, in all of my patients. Uh, not all of them are successfully able to do that. And I watch them like a hawk with development of elevated intractable pressure. So back to our kid. In June of 2017, he, he presents with an arthritis flare, snowmobile thickening in his knees, and some inflammation in his left eye. So what do we do for him? Well, he's got anterior segment inflammation, right? So we've got to treat that. We switched him to subcutaneous methotrexate. And why would we switch him to subcutaneous methotrexate? He wasn't really having any problems taking the oral medication, but why do you think subcutaneous might be a choice? Subcutaneous methotrexate is a little bit more bioavailable, so it works a little bit better. And it is also associated with, with less frequent uh, uh, nausea, but you know, kids still get nausea. Is that all we could do for him? He's been, you know, cooking along for a couple of years with this. Well, we wanted to treat him a little harder. So we started with him with a biologic agent and we started with infliximab uh, every four weeks. And uh, part of the reason for choosing infliximab was uh, to give him a higher dose and to ensure that he was getting treated because he had to show up for his infusions. We also pulsed him with some oral prednisone to help him with pain uh, on a one week course. So we did pretty well with that. And in 2009, we were able to extend his infliximab interval at milder arthritis of his knees and on infliximab at Q8 weeks and methotrexate at 12.5 with no ocular inflammation. The decision was made to transition him to adalimumab for ease of administration of his uh, uh, biologic. As you know, adalimumab is, is approved for adult uveitis uh, and for JAA, uh, and it is humanized monoclonal antibody, which can be uh, administered subcutaneously at home. For this particular person, that presented certain problems uh, for social reasons, but in any case, we made that decision, short course of prednisone, kept it on 12.5 milligrams of methotrexate. Well, um, in November, he uh, came back with a flare of uveitis um, and uh, decent vision, but still you know, unacceptably elevated inflammation. The plan here was to start Drizzle, which I don't infrequently with children, but he had a lot of inflammation in his eye. And then discontinued Humira, and we started another biologic called Orencia, or Abadicept, which at the time uh, was showing promise for children with JIA. Um, in, he then represented with low-grade intraocular inflammation, persistent arthritis, and after you know a, a six month to nine month I, you know on this medication was declared abyssept failure. Our plan we went back to what was working okay, to infliximab, increases methotrexate, so, uh, and then treated him with topical corticosteroids. This seemed to actually work for him. Okay, he had quiescent uveitis and arthritis, and over the ensuing year we were able to. Um, extend his infliximab interval out from every month to every six weeks, and then to reduce his methotrexate dose and to extend him out to uh, eight weeks. So this is just gives you a little vignette of, uh, you know, it's never over 
I, to the fat lady sings, right? You know, in baseball, but I, it's never really over for JIA either. Um, they don't, uh, there's very good evidence to suggest that um, a significant proportion of children don't really outgrow their inflammation. Uh, and so there are plenty of adults that have had JIA that still have ocular inflammation and structural complications. And I have many of these patients in my clinic. So you have all read about JIA, and I'll just give you a quick tour of JIA, unless someone else wants to do it for me, but I thought I would save some of the more rarefied entities for you guys, okay? So this is probably the most important disease for you guys to know about. It encompasses a spectrum of childhood arthritis, and depending upon how you classify it, there are three different classification syndromes. It's called something either juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile chronic arthritis or juvenile idiopathic arthritis, which is what we use the National League Against Rheumatism. So there you have a kid, he's got, you know, uh, inflammation of his joints and his hands, the most common form of chronic arthritis in childhood, and the most common systemic association with iridocyclitis, you know, comprising up to a third of tertiary uh, patients in tertiary care settings uh, in the pediatric population. Okay. So the risk for the development of uveitis, okay, it depends on the classification system, but in the, in the uh, ILI or IAR system, the JIA subtype is very important, okay? And so what subtype is the most commonly associated with iridocyclitis in JIA? Anyone? So I'm gonna go through it with you. So it's oligoarticular disease. Anybody know what oligoarticular disease is? More or less joints. Right, exactly. Okay, so it can be persistent or extended. Okay. So oligoarticular disease carries about a 30% chance of uh, inflammation. And then in the ILAR system, there are these other categories, uh, rheumatoid factor negative uh, and positive polyarthritis psoriatic arthritis, which is notoriously difficult to treat, and emphysitis-related arthritis, which behaves more like um, a acute uh, HLA-B27-associated disease and is more common in, in boys. And then, of course, unidentified. NA positivity carries a significant risk of uveitis. So NA positive oligoarticular disease is a not-so-great combination. Then, of course, there's younger age of onset of arthritis between two and five years and female sex. So it goes back to Adam and Eve, you know, the uh, females carrying that bad apple here. However, we'll see that it changes uh, in terms of, um, you know, their prognosis. And then there are HLA associations with uh, the development of uveitis. Okay, the presentation we kind of went over with, it, with Damien here. Uh, asymptomatic chronic bilateral non-granulomas, uh, iridocyclitis. They're not going to tell you that they have disease. Peak onset is up to four years of age. This is important in that 90% um, uh, follow articular disease, but 10% may precede the onset of arthritis. So you have a significant proportion of patients that are smoldering out there before entry into the healthcare system. And many of these patients are the ones that present with really severe complications or those that are held on to, by the referring physician too long. Uh, systemic ocular inflammatory activity can be independent so that you can have arthritis activity without intraocular inflammation and vice versa, or it can be simultaneous. Predictors of poor visual prognosis, okay? This is a poor visual prognosis between 2015 and 2100 as uh, studied at the site study, which was a large retrospective study of five huge uveitis practices in the United States. So active inflammation. So that's why the mantra is, you know, control of inflammation and active inflammation as described by greater than or equal to one plus AC cell or greater than or equal to 0 0.5 plus vitreous cell. The presence of posterior sneakia that is a marker for previous disease, as I said to you, before a presentation with ocular complications is in itself a risk for the development of future complications and posterior sneak is one of them. And then it turned out prior intraocular surgery, which makes sense because you know kids that have had surgery before probably have had structural complications. 
So here you have anterior segment inflammation. And UVI, as we talked about before, are concurrent with the diagnosis of UVIS. So they, there may be a delay with uh, entry into the healthcare system, a shorter interval from the onset of arthritis to UVI's prolonged referral to a specialist, and male sex seem to do poorer than, than females in terms of visual uh, outcome. The site study identified ocular complications, which I think you guys have identified before. Okay, band keratopathy, posterior sepia, cataract, ocular hypertension, macular edema, heavy retinal membrane, and hypotony. Okay. And they occur at a pretty high percentage, right? 34, 29%, 22% per year, per eye year. 60% um, of these patients I uh, present with at least one complication at presentation. Okay? And the incidence of a new complication is about 15% per year. So we have to do a good, better job at, you know, um, at controlling inflammation. So the therapeutic approach, as we discussed previously, is this kind of therapeutic step ladder with frequent topical steroids using diflupredinate with caution because I think that this induces ocular hypertension particularly in children. Oral non um, are frequently used for patients with arthritis and may be steroid sparing, um, but I don't use them as primary intention for steroid sparing therapy and keep them on it, obviously, if the child is on it and for their arthritis. Periocular and intravitreal corticosteroids are used with caution in children for the very same reasons in that ocular hypertension is more of a complication in kids and it's a little bit more difficult to uh, you know, get it out. I don't wanna be putting tubes in children if you can help it. Brief, brief well-defined periods of systemic corticosteroids and then steroid spraying immunomodulatory therapy. So in our introductory lecture, we went over the classes of medications that were used, the antimetabolites, including methotrexate, mycophenolate, azathioprine, the, the calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, Alkylating agents are really not used uh, for JIA these days as we have uh, biological therapies. Just a word about methotrexate. <clears throat> it's the first line in JIA and probably the first line in uh, adult uveitis in terms of steroid sparing uh, medication. <clears throat> and there's good data from uh, the Netherlands uh, where they have huge databases of kids with JIA. And that is, it's useful in counseling the parents of patients with JIA. And that is that you know, when you put patient on an anti-metabolite or embark upon immunomodulatory therapy, you're talking about a long-term commitment. And so they're not on it for just a year. Um, there's good data to suggest a longer period of time of inactivity, that is longer period of time on medication without steroids, um, results in a better chance of remission of disease. So we're talking three years is better than one year. And then an older age at the time of withdrawal and it was shown that a reduction of new onset of uveitis was less frequent when patients were treated within the first year of diagnosis. There are alternatives to non-responders, such as other anti-metabolites, mycophenolate and azathioprine, which are used less frequently in kids. Cyclosporin um, is used as less frequently, but is well tolerated in children as opposed to adults at higher doses. Um, and then early, so we, I don't use this as often as I used to, but I have a very low threshold now that we have good biologics to advance them to biological therapy if they have persistent activity while on an antimetabolite. So here is a summary table of all the biologics that uh, are in common, that are in use. There are hundreds of other biologics out there in development. And I think that you're familiar with many of them. We won't dwell on that, but the ones that are the most common that you might see in, in that a child might be on would be these three uh, TNF inhibitors. Chanercept um, is not particularly useful in uveitis, but many kids will be placed on etanercept uh, for their arthritis. So it, it works well for arthritis, but not for uveitis. So if a child comes in on etanercept and they're, they have they have oligoarticular disease and they need to be screened every three months and they don't have inflammation in their eye, then there's no reason to switch them until they develop um, inflammation, in which case we would switch them to a different biologic such as adalimumab. Um, so adalimumab, as you know, is FDA approved in adults and in children. 
uh, for uh, uveitis, but not for chronic anterior uveitis, interestingly, in, in adults. And uh, the advantage to this medication is that it's humanized, less immunogenic, and can be administered subcutaneously. Um, whether or not it's more effective than infliximab is a matter of debate. Uh, they seem to be equal potent, but infliximab does have a couple of advantages that uh, in certain cases, such as our first case, um, as we'll see. You, I just want to bring your attention to the fact that there was a trial that was conducted, a multi-centered trial in uh, Great Britain called the Sycamore trial, um, in which they looked at the um, uh, clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness of adalimumab uh, for, uh, uh, plus methotrexate versus methotrexate alone. And basically the study show, con confirmed kind of the clinical practice that uh, of the um, superiority uh, of both the use of both methotrexate and adalimumab together um, rather than methotrexate uh, alone. Uh, so there were significant differences in the time to treatment response and a, a significantly great, greater proportion in the reduction of, uh, 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 of uh, treatment failure with the combination. Um, infliximab is also quite useful. Uh, the disadvantage being that it needs to be administered subcutaneously. It's a chimera, so uh, it is a mass human antibody and is usually administered uh, together with uh, methotrexate for, to reduce the chances of uh, anti-infliximab antibodies. Um, methotrexate also will reduce the incidence of anti-adalimumab anti antibodies, which can also occur and decrease the efficacy of that medication, but less frequently, occurs less frequently than that with infliximab. The, one of the advantages of infliximab is that it can be administered at higher doses. Uh, uh, so anywhere from five to 20 milligrams per kilogram. Um, it, you can shorten the infusion interval to uh, monthly and then extend it. Uh, so it allows a little bit more flexibility with, in terms of dosing. The uh, bottom line is that none of these medications are ma magic bullets. Uh, they are not remitted. That is, it doesn't, the rate of remission is low and uh, it doesn't cure the disease. So we have to be willing to use alternative medications. And some of those alternatives include alternative uh, medications in the same class, uh, 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 anti-TNF such as galimumab or sertolizumab. Uh, uh, and then third line, biologic agents directed against different cytokines. Uh, uh, Badicep or Rencia is one that, we, that our patient had. Um, it's not particularly effective in uveitis. Uh, as our experience has borne out. And then of course, there are other medications against specific cytokines, such as rituximab uh, and um, tocilizumab, which are coming to the fore and have been shown to be useful, um, both in adults and, and ch children with, with refractory GIA. So does it work? Yeah, it does actually. So uh, in both single center studies that uh, um, uh, Hopkins, um, there's a reduced risk of ocular complications, as you can see here, and 86% improvement in visual acuity um, with patients on IMT that are, were administered early. And the side cohort, uh, which is, again, this large retrospective study bore this out uh, fairly recently with a 60% reduction in visual loss, uh, particularly for the um, less than uh, 2050 outcome. Okay, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Getting, getting tired. <laughs> this is a pretty interesting case. Four-year-old kid uh, with right eye pain for two months. Parents didn't observe any changes in behavior. Uh, this patient was seen uh, in Cincinnati. Okay? And uh, he had a brief episode of diarrhea that responded spontaneously. Uh, cousin with parsonitis and really, no past medical history. His vision was pretty good. Uh, he had anterior segment inflammation uh, in the right eye uh, and it was quiet in the left, but he had an inferior pigmented iris mass in the angle, okay? And that's what this mass looked like here, okay? And uh, this patient was referred to me by 
a former attending in the pediatrics department here. And she performed a uh, B scan, which shows this mass here. And did an examination under anesthesia, which so posterior lesions here that were deep, right? So it was beneath the retina and the choroid, it seemed to me, in both eyes. So she had a little bit more guts than uh, I would ever have in uh, diagnosing this. So the a fluorescein angiogram, or in evaluating this patient, fluorescein angiogram shows some delay in the choroidal filling, but certainly staining of these lesions. And there was subrenal fluid in the right eye on OCT. So these are images from Cincinnati. So she went ahead and decided to work the patient up extensively uh, uh, up the wazoo. That's the te te technical name for that. But everything I could possibly think of, okay? And biopsy this patient, okay? So I would be a little, I, I would be a little bit hesitant to do that uh, only because of the risk of that, you know, could represent an RB. But I think that she was pretty confident that it would represent an inflammatory disease. And indeed, that's what the pathology seemed to indicate. So she was uh, the child was referred here with a diagnosis of panuvitis multifocal choroiditis, right eye greater than the left eye. So what is the differential diagnosis that you would think of in a case like this? I mentioned one of them. What would you guys think? I think sarcoid or Blau syndrome would also be on my list. Anything else? Okay, so early onset sarcoid. Things that kind of mimic sarcoid, like rare diseases such as Blau syndrome or familial systemic juvenile granulomatosis. Epstein-Barr virus, this retinocortis is just a real rare red herring that I've seen twice here. Common variable immunodeficiency syndrome, probably not that rare. Um, seen it a couple of times here and it may look very much like uh, early onset sarcoid or uh, multifocal choroiditis. So the plan was to place the patient on prednisone because we were fairly convinced that this did not represent an infectious etiology. The patient was already on Valtrex, and we treated the patient with Durazole for a brief period of time, atropine. And over two months, became quiet with flattening of the lesions and tapered the Valtrex to a suppressive dose and continued the prednisone taper. And sure enough, there was, at least in the posterior poll, resolution of these lesions. There was resolution of the subrenal fluid just on prednisone. So off of prednisone for a month, recurrent AC cell and a new red papular mash on the cheeks and arms and legs. So it was, you know, kind of giving us more of a clue as to maybe what was happening uh, diagnostically. Sometimes the diagnosis is not, you know, apparent to you immediately and it develops in time. So you staying in the hunt is usually uh, what is necessary and new symptoms and new signs emerge. So our plan here was since the patient had already been on course of steroids when he was a young kid to start immunomodulatory therapy with a, another steroid bridge. Okay. And two months later, the patient was quiet. Okay. Skin rash had resolved. The rash um, was thought to be consistent with, was not biopsied, by the way, unfortunately, because it was almost evanescent, but thought to maybe be con uh, consistent with one of two, uh, one common, one uncommon disease. So we continued methotrexate and prednisone. And one of the uncommon diseases we tested for has a NOD2 mutation. Um, actually, both of these diseases do. Uh, and um, so that was negative. And we'll discuss what that mutation represents. So our working diagnosis was sporadic juvenile sarcoidosis. And over time, the patient did well without reactivation of disease on steroid sparing methotrexate. So sarcoidosis is commonly, you know, is a commonly cited as a cause of childhood uveitis, but it's actually not that common. And there are two, two types of, two forms of it. One is juvenile or early onset, 
in less than five years of age, and then there's later onset. And the early onset is a little bit different um, in that it can present with uh, cutaneous papules and plaques and erythema nodosum. So that gave us this kind of clue that maybe this patient had early onset sarcoidosis. He didn't have polyarticular arthritis, ocular inflammation, any uh, lesion. But the other thing is that usually pulmonary disease does not develop in early onset sarcoid. And uh, recent work has suggested that a significant proportion of these diseases will carry a certain type of mutation, which is present in another rare disease and represents the sporadic form of that disease. So the card nod two mutation on chromosome 16. Um, so late onset uh, sarcoidosis um, is very similar to that in adults with a high proportion of pulmonary disease. Okay, so the phenotype uh, is you know, chronic bilateral granulomatous intrauveitis with virus nodules, uh, intermediate posteriorvitis and lacrimal gland involvement is uncommon. Um, I suppose if you had, you know, ACE is physiologically elevated in children, so the lysozyme would be better in older children in chest x-ray with thin cut spiral CT and a biopsy. So obviously uh, the only thing that uh, Anna had to biopsy was the eye, but if you had a biopsy, if you had the skin or a um, uh, iris nodule to biopsy, that would be a place to, to go first uh, rather than the lung uh, in an older child. And the differential diagnosis is JIA, really. So the, the differentiating features between sarcoid and JIA, right, are non-granulomas versus granulomas, anterior involvement in JIA, where anything, any involvement uh, in uh, sarcoid, oligoarticular disease, less than four joints, less than or equal to four joints, polyarticular disease in sarcoid. And then in juvenile sarcoid, uh, sarcoid pulmonary involvement um, uh, can, can, uh, can occur, but it, uh, usually in later onset disease, but it's absent in JAA. So the differential diagnosis of childhood sarcoid, when you hear of hoofbeats, you think of what? You think of horses, but there are zebras, okay? And here's, here's one of them, okay? Here's a child that presents with this kind of uh, granulomas rash, it's poly, uh, arthritis, granulomas arthritis, granulomas anterior uveitis with, with sneakia and multifocal choroiditis. Okay. So here is a zebra that is similar to sar sarcoidosis in kids. Uh, anybody have an idea of what this might be? We've mentioned it a couple of times already. Is there any pulmonary findings? Uh, no pulmonary findings. Blouse? Blau, right. So other names for Blau. So it's a triad of granulomas, dermatitis, polyarthritis, uveitis, and the absence of pulmonary disease. Okay. Also known as familial juvenile systemic granulomas, ptosis, Blau, Jabs syndrome. They were described at the same time. Anybody want to tell us a little bit about this rare entity? Did you guys read up on any of the rarities? I left it up to you to read what you like. Anybody, a couple of fun facts. Is this, uh, what, is the, what is the kind of onset of this disease usually? Later childhood, early childhood? Early. Early childhood, right. And uh, what do what they present? Um, what about family history, is that important? Autosomal dominant. Yeah, right. So it's really important, right? So it's an autosomal dominantly inherited disease, and it is phenotyp and it is phenotypically, uh, you know, linked one hundred percent to a certain mutation that we've mentioned a few times. Right? So the nod to mutation. Okay. Triad dermatitis, arthritis. Uh, anybody know what Campylodactyly is? Anyhow, it's a um, flexion deformity of the um, proximal interphalangeal joint, absence of pulmonary disease in a kid, autosomal dominant, as you had mentioned, linked to chromosome 16 with, uh, with a nod to mutation. So most commonly, these children will have panuveitis and multifocal choroiditis, and uh, they can develop other 
uh, simulating diseases that are un, that are less common, such as you know vasculopathy. But the differential is really early onset uh, sarcoid or NJIA. There are patients with early onset sarcoidosis that do have a nod to mutation, so um, though they are thought to be the same disease. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to a different disease entity. This was a 10-year-old male uh, that was referred to me with a non-granulomas and enterovitis and papillitis, which began after fever, vomiting, and uh, coughing, had optic nerve swelling, AC inflammation, and was treated basically with topical corticosteroids. Okay, the complicating factor was that uh, he was living in China with his parents, uh, and his parents were diplomats, so they came for consultation. Um, he had an exposure history that was of interest, um, but difficult to really know exactly specifically what all this would mean. He was worked up initially in China and in Singapore, where they have very famous, you know, uveitis uh, and inflammatory service. Uh, fairly completely, and I say fairly completely because it was incomplete. Um, and uh, it showed a few abnormalities, but uh, elevated SED rate is certainly nonspecific, but indicates there's some type of systemic inflammation going on. He had recurrent febrile episodes, you know, joint aches, diarrhea, lost about seven pounds. On examination when we saw him, uh, he had reduced vision in his right eye. He had bilateral inflammation that was significant. Uh, posterior sneakia, structural complications, and cells in his vitreous, and papillitis in both eyes. What I did not see, uh, which is important, is any multifocal lesions in the back of his eye. Um, I was looking for them because one can see that uh, in this entity, not frequently, but it can occur. So the plan, we ordered some, we reordered her, the workup and we included one item on the workup that was missing previously and uh, was also based on the patient's review of systems. What one lab was missing in this particular workup? Can anybody think of what that might be in a child with bilateral anterior uveitis with a systemic febrile illness? Okay, so I would always order beta-2 microglobulin of the urine in a patient with bilateral anterior uveitis in, in a child or in a young female adult. Uh, we also worked him up for a lot of other uh, entities that given his travel history and his exposure, which were interestingly negative, except for and I'll tell you, his initial treatment was with uh, durazole and atropine. His beta-2 microglobulin was elevated, but the ratio to the CRT was astronomically elevated. His creatinine was uh, okay, normal CBC, and we suspected that he had a tubulo interstitial nephritis and sent him to the renal service who did perform a renal biopsy. And uh, indeed, that, was that diagnosis was confirmed with the presence of interstitial uh, inflammation uh, with lymphocytes and rare plasma cells and some eosinophils around it and necrosis of the tubules. So TINU uh, is not that common, but uh, is something to always think about in kids that present with bilateral simultaneous uh, anterior uveitis and in adults, young adults that present similarly. Um, this was one of the other disease entities that uh, you could have read about that I suggested you read about. Um, I think the important thing is that always think about it with bilateral non granulomas recurrent anterior uveitis. Okay, um, nephritis usually precedes the uh, anterior uveitis, but it can be occur before or after. It can be occur after or con concomitantly. Um, there are usually multiple exacerbations and there can be posterior segment findings uh, in a not insignificant number of patients. So there've been some recent publications 
actually that have shown a much a higher rate of you know, multifocal type of choroiditis in patients with TINU. So it's something to look for. Again, there's kind of this bimodal distribution with kids and uh, young adults with, uh, initially I was thought to have a female predominance, but uh, recent publications suggest more males, 2% of a tertiary uvi setting, which is, uh, and then uh, there is a uh, uh, genetic predisposition to developing the disease. Exactly why they develop it, I don't know. It could be an idiopathic response or drug hypersensitivity or a microbial trigger. The diagnosis, obviously renal biopsy is definitive, but it's not realistic sometimes to uh, perform a renal biopsy in a, in a kid, uh, particularly if they have completely normal um, you know, studies. Uh, there are diagnostic criteria that have been established uh, by Mandeville, um, which include abnormal serum creatinine, beta microglobulin, systemic illness. The differential diagnosis uh, includes other things that affect the kidneys, like you know lupus, GPA, uh, Sjogren's, post-streptococcal syndrome. Uh, I mentioned because it's, that's an important thing to consider in patients with bilateral simultaneous uh, anterior uveitis. Bechet's disease, TB, and syphilis. So for treatment, uh, topical or systemic steroids usually work well. However, um, uh, about 9 to 11% of patients can, will require uh, IMT. Uh, uh, and it seems like the uh, nephrologists like to use uh, mycophenolate for this disease. So this patient was, was started on oral prednisone and Celsap and has done extremely well. And beta 2 microglobulin is followed uh, either by us or by both us and renal and indicates a decrease uh, in certainly renal activity. And of course, we can see the, re the treatment response information in the eye. Okay, so someone's called for consult, you know, over to primary children's hospital with a kid that has these findings. Someone feel this one. What are, what are we looking at in the hands and the groin and the lips? Miss child. Is there, is this- it looks kind of like scalded skin. Scalded skin, okay. Does kinda, it lose skin red? Kind of looks like um, Kawasaki. And what makes you say that? the lips and the hands if that child opened its mouth and showed you his tongue what would you see what might you see just strawberry tongue right okay so i think that's what this diagnosis is okay desquamator brash uh, and the fingers in the groin uh, on the lips and uh, this child also had a strawberry tongue tell me about what is it also called Kawasaki's disease another name for it Everything in ophthalmology is named after some guy, right? Not too many women, right? But Kawasaki is a guy. So it's a more descriptive term is mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome, right? Okay, children usually less than, you know, 10 years of age, usually Asian South Pacific Islanders, okay? What is the thing that you really worry about with Kawasaki disease? It's certainly not their eye disease. Coronary artery involvement. Right, exactly. So it's a systemic vasculitis with small, uh, uh, rather small and medium vessels and coronary vasculitis present in a significant portion of patients and can uh, have a fairly high mortality, right? How about ocular manifestations? There's kind of a distinctive ocular uh, presentation that's I don't know why they would ever ask you this on a board question, but they this is the type of stuff that people that write questions ask. So what is the most common eye finding in Kawasaki? Just conjunctivitis. Right, and is there any particular um, pattern of conjunctivitis that is peculiar to it? I'm not sure, actually. Okay, uh, it spares the limbus, okay? 
And so just keep that in your head uh, for, for no reason. Use your subconjunctival. So it's bilateral conjunctivitis that bears the most 90% of them. So conjunctival hemorrhage. You can have a mild bilateral anterior uveitis. Um, the, you can have optic disc and vitreous opacities and dilated retinal veins. Treatment is with IVIG uh, and topical steroids for their eye disease. Now, topical IVIG is very important in reducing you know, uh, coronary impairment and mortality. Okay, here's an interesting patient that has an unusual disease. Well, it's not that unusual. It, I learned something with this patient, but um, it's a different uh, anatomic uh, presentation of the disease, uh, of a systemic disease. So it's an eight-year-old white kid, as referred from an outside position, seen initially for one month of decreased vision. He was diagnosed, and I quote, put pan uveitis in there because I don't think that was the correct diagnostic, um, you know, designation with macular edema, and had been placed on Pred Forte in home atrophy. Okay, he had negative review assistance, but he did carry a diagnosis of something that I hadn't heard about at the, when I first uh, met this child: periodic fevers, aplastic stomatitis, pharyngitis, and cervical adenitis which is marked by recurrent fevers or ulcers. And it's usually well controlled with systemic steroids. I didn't really know that this is a very common uh, autoimmune, autoinflammatory disease of childhood. So uh, family history was actually interesting. Uh, so there's a family history of autoimmune disease, ulcerative colitis and multiple sclerosis. Uh, on his examination, he had a decreased vision in his right eye. Uh, as to be expected um, from his presentation and anterior tumor cell. But dilated ex fundus examination showed detritus and of course, macular edema, right? Mild epiretinal membrane. He had peripheral snow banking with inferior pars plana exudates and snowballs, right eye aggression greater than left eye, no knee vascularization. So he has an intermediate type of uveitis, right? associated with some disease, right? With maybe, that may be associated with a uh, systemic disease. He also has snow banking. Okay, so we worked him up to exclude infectious diseases. And we gave him a diagnosis of intermediate uveitis with macular edema, possibly associated with PFAPA. Okay, so not parsclenitis because he has a systemic disease association. In fact, um, this was the first uh, of two cases uh, that have been described uh, with this disease association of intermediate mediatis associated with this. He was treated with uh, topical steroids and his CME resolved with a sub tenons catalog. Okay, we wanted to spare systemic steroid in, in this child in his left eye. Okay. Nine months later, it came in with a blurry onset of. Uh, a vision was found to have vitreous hemorrhage in his right eye, knee vascularization in his left eye uh, on EOA. And his plan, the plan was to perform vitrectomy in the right eye, which we did, uh, endolaser and peripheral laser in his left eye. So it's kind of interesting. This case is interesting, and I'll show you why in a minute. He had a vitrectomy in his right eye, peripheral laser for that in his left eye. He then was quiet and stable off of all medications for two years and represents with a flare with a decreased vision in his left eye, okay? The non vitrectomized eye with anterior chamber and vitreous cell. Um, he had macular edema, who has authored IVT and Ozodex, he was a little bit older at this time. Uh, uh, he declined those because he just didn't want to get anything injected in his eyes. Sometimes the patients know better. And he was placed on oral prednisone and we discussed IMT and he declined it but it resolved over two months. Okay, so you can read about this on your own, but this is the most common autoinflammatory fever uh, disease of uh, fever disorder in childhood uh, and usually resolves spontaneously by the second decade. The interesting thing about this case was that, uh, as we will see in this discussion of intermediate uveitis and parsplenitis, that the child had a vitrectomy in the right eye when he was younger, and then really never had a recurrence of inflammation in the right eye following that, but 
any recurrences were in the non protectomized lung. So there is the thought that maybe in intermediate uveitis, that protectomy may be a useful therapeutic intervention in some cases. It certainly required a, ther a therapeutic protectomy, right? Because you had a vitreous hemorrhage. So we're just going to kind of have a segue here uh, into uh, intermediate uveitis and prostonitis, because I think this is a kind of a good place to. That. So let's talk about this. Is intermediate uveitis and parse punch either the same thing? So sometimes they're used as interchangeable uh, terms, but are they the same thing? Anyone? It's a yes or no question. No. Okay, and why is that? What is the fundamental it's difference between parse planitis indicates that it is uh well, parsimonitis is the most common cause of intermediate u uveitis, and intermediate uveitis has a known etiology like sarcoid, whereas parsimonitis, I believe, is idiopathic. Exactly. That's very good. I think that's a good way to think about it. So maybe parsimonitis is a subcategory of intermediate uveitis, right? Parsimonitis is the idiopathic variant of intermediate uveitis. So intermediate uveitis is a broad term. Describes inflammation that's primarily located in the anterior vitreous ciliary body and peripheral retina, which may or may not be associated with an infection or systemic disease. So you have to exclude infections and systemic diseases and masquerade syndromes, right, in intermediate uveitis. Whereas pars planitis is the idiopathic version of that after things have been excluded, but it is usually characterized by the presence of what we call, what are commonly referred to as snowballs or snowbanks without associated infectious or systemic disease. So you'll hear the term snowball and snowbank. And my mentor, you know, would cut my snowballs off if we used snowballs as a descriptive term, and he would prefer that you actually call them by what they are, which are accumulations of fibroglial tissue over vessels in the inferior parts plana or inflammatory cells in the inferior parts of the planet or vitreous and inflammatory exudates in the vitreous. It's a mouthful, but I think it is a little bit more descriptive. I don't mind snowballs and snowbanks. I know what you're talking about. Okay, most commonly located inferiorly. I think there's a gravitational effect to that, but in patients with really severe intermediate or UVS or um, with parts planets, it can be 360. It can encompass the entire uh, part of the planet and is best visualized by scleral depression. Uh, the uh, pars plana snowbank or uh, exudate can be vascularized. So I think it's important to actually pay attention to whether or not there are new vessels uh, on the uh, uh, snowbank and then to look for tractional elevation of the, of the adjacent retina. There are some also some, uh, it can be associated with exudative retinal detachment with um, very severe uh, disease, uh, very, uh, you know, a severe disease. And then there can be some other structural complications that we can talk about that appear uh, not uncommonly in patients with pars planitis. So this is what we're talking about, okay? This is uh, pars plana, uh, you know, infiltrates in the retinal periphery. So it's not in the retina, it's above the retina in the gel. And they're characterized by inflammatory cells and fibroglial homes. So um, why is it important? Well, you know, uh, it's not uncommon. So we see a fair amount of intermediate and parsimonitis in the pediatric uveitis population. And it can be up to 50. So in just uveitis, in, in just general UVI's practice is about 15% and up to a larger percentage in pediatric uh, uh, practices of uh, uh, practices comprising the UVI's um, population. So it's most frequently uh, bilateral, but it can be asymmetric, right? Um, and usually in adults, uh, ocular pain and redness is uncommon. And the most common presenting symptoms are are floaters, blurred vision, or decreased central vision due to the more common complications of this disease. What, what, why do you think patients present with decreased central vision in intermediate UVS and parts planets? What, 
structural complications you think is the most common cause of decreased vision in that disease? CME. Yeah, exactly. CME. So it's a little bit different story in, in kids. Uh, not terribly different. It's just that the disease seems to be a little bit more uh, you know, severe. So kids do present with anterosegment inflammation, pain, redness, and photophobia, you know, which is a little less commonly seen in adults. Here is a really great photograph, I think, of what vitreous cells look like. So this is at least two plus vitreous cell. You know, these are the uh, pars plana, rather uh, vitreous exudates or snowballs. Vitritis is really the sine qua non of uh, or vitreous inflammation of intermediate uveitis. Uh, one can also have other structural complications in the renal periphery, including cyclitic membrane uh, and separation. So retinal vasculitis is not unfrequently complicating this disease. And it's most, most commonly a retinal periphlebitis, so uh, inflammation involving the veins. Vascular occlusion and peripheral ischemia can occur. Okay? And peripheral neovascularization of the, of the retina and the optic nerve can also occur. And this can be inflammatory or it can be ischemic and a complication of neurovascularization, of course, as you know, is vitreous hemorrhage, which seems to be a more frequent presenting complication in children, you know, with 28% uh, versus 6% uh, or 20% uh, in presentation versus 1% in adults. So why do you think uh, it's important to know whether or not the neovascularization that you might see on the optic nerve or the retinal periphery uh, is inflammatory or ischemic, and how would you tell that difference? How would you kind of make that determination? I mean, what test would you order? You're an FA. Yeah, you do an FA, right. And what would the FA tell you? What might it show you? We'll see some examples of this. But. If there was a lot of leakage, you could think of it be more like an inflammatory or vasculitis rather than right. ischemic. Okay, right. And if you had, on the other hand, non perfusion. Right. Okay. You might think it more of an ischemic. And why is that important? Does with the treatment of those two differ, do you think? Yeah, it would be like steroids or. You know, immune modulating stuff versus maybe laser. It was well, I, yeah, yeah, I think that's very good. You know, I mean, so I, I've had several cases of patients that presented with neovascularization of the disc, um, whose neovascular that had no ischemia uh, on fluorescein angiography, and the neovascularization kind of melted away with anti inflammatory treatment. So I think it's important, and so you spare the patient, you know, potentially destructive. Uh, a laser procedure. Then, of course, macular edema is the most common form of decreased central vision. So, again, I hammer home these differential diagnoses lists. Okay, um, of course, it, it's an academic exercise, but they're not long lists, right? And they're important to think about. Um, and you base your, you know, your hit list or your top five or your top three, you know, based upon your review of systems and your examination. So you can have infections, right? Syphilis, sarcoid, syphilis and TB. Always think about sarcoid. You can have Bartonella, toxoplasmosis. You can have really weird infections like Wibble's disease or endophthalmitis. So, you know, we always perform preponemal testing in patients, quantifying gold testing uh, in patients uh, to rule out TB and also uh, because sometimes we anticipate these patients will be placed on steroids systemically or on IMT. Chest X-ray, again, probably the most important screening tool for patients with uh, uh, sarcoidosis. You know, Wibble's disease, I've seen one case of that uh, and that was diagnosed in a duodenal biopsy. And if we don't really know, sometimes we need to do PCR, 
if it's for an occult infection. Uh, sometimes a set chest CT uh, is necessary when the chest X-ray uh, is normal, but you have a higher suspicion of uh, sarcoidosis. And then an MRI may or may not be uh, useful in patients with parsimonitis, as we'll discuss a little bit. And then uh, if there is the suspicion for a masquerade syndrome, certainly diagnostic vitrectomy with studies, uh, molecular studies and flow cytometry for lymphoma. Okay, complications, cataract and glaucoma, band keratopathy, vitreous hemorrhage due to knee vascularization, tractional retinal attachment, and regmatogenous retinal attachment can occur. And then there are, are some complications that you don't think about too much that occur more commonly than you would think. So retinoschisis can occur in a fairly significant portion of patients, as you can see here on uh, ultrasound. Uh, retinoschisis, the etiology of that uh, is not 100% known, and there are two schools of thought on that. Uh, one is that it is tractional, and the other then that it's ischemic. It's probably a combination of both. Macular edema, number one, epiretinal membrane, amblyopian kids, and then vasoproliferative tumors can occur in a small proportion of patients uh, with um, parsimonitis, as you can see here. And that needs to be treated you know, with uh, usually cryotherapy or laser. One very important uh, uh, thing to know about parsimonitis, particularly in young women, is that they're is this associated risk between parsimonitis and the development of multiple sclerosis. Um, there is an HLA uh, DR15 association, uh, and it seems that periphlebitis may be a risk for uh, increased MS and optic neuritis. So it is important uh, when uh, evaluating a patient with parsimonitis that you have made a diagnosis of parsimonitis and excluded systemic and infectious etiologies to query the patient uh, about signs and symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Um, treatment of pediatric intermediate uveitis, I think you have to be, uh, if, it's, if you have significant inflammatory disease, early and aggressive treatment, particularly in a younger age when you have structural complications that are at presentation, significant vitreous opacities. And again, we use this kind of modified uh, step ladder approach. Cryopexy and indirect laser are, um, I think, under probably underutilized, uh, but uh, may be very effective, particularly in patients that have vascularized um, uh, exudates and um, pars plana, uh, neovascularization on their on their pars plana. Uh, there is uh, one can perform cryopexy or indirect laser. Um, there have been studies that date back, you know, 25, 30 years ago uh, that seem to indicate that, um, that those interventions, uh, particularly initially described by Auberg uh, with uh, cryopexy, that it reduces both inflammation and macular edema. But that's kind of like before the age of IMT, and it's kind of used less frequently. It's always used in patients that undergo vitrectomy, but I think that we will find now that we have better you know, wide field imaging that we may see more uh, non-perfusion. And it may be that patients that have extremely recalcitrant disease may respond well um, to uh, cryopexy and indirect laser. I just wanna bring your attention to uh, paper that we published uh, on the use of immunosuppressive medications in pediatric intermediate uveitis, uh, we found that you know, I am, uh, immunomodulation was used in you know, over half of these patients. And um, you know, we were able to get these patients off of steroids in almost every one of those patients without a recurrence. So I think that's actually a pretty good outcome. You, know? um, you don't wanna have kids on, on uh, steroids and you want to have their inflammation well controlled. Just bring your attention to another uh, paper. This is from Ploster's group in which he actually performed therapeutic vitrectomy in patients with recalcitrant uveitis, recalcitrant to um, IMT, and found that vitrectomy contributed to the control of 
inflammation, both for pure uveitis and, and that complicated by retinal vasculitis. I, I don't think that this is done very frequently, but it's a very interesting idea. Uh, vitrectomy in children poses a lot of potential complications. The vitro-retinal people uh, in the audience, you know, uh, their highlights are attached. Um, you don't want to create a iatrogenic problem in, in a kid. But if nothing else is working, it may be something to consider. Again, I, I wanted to bring your attention to this idea of peripheral cryoablation because it's been recently kind of resurrected uh, by a paper that was performed from a group from Iowa. And the, the take home messages from this paper, which I didn't assign to you, is that um, it resulted in about a fourfold uh, remission rate. Um, you know, by using peripheral cryoablation in patients with parasitinitis, remission rate, that is no medication. Uh, and it did not, as is commonly thought, result in greater uh, incidence of retinal detachment. Um, so usually uh, I have used this uh, when there's uh, the presence of neovascularization, particularly on the pars plana exudate, because you cannot really get good laser into an exudate, but you can, uh, you can cryo it. And then I did assign this paper to you guys, or had you just glance at it, remission of intermediate uveitis, incidence and predictive factors. Again, this is the site group, and this was, I think, four of the five, uh, uh, four of the five institutions. And, um, you know, I won't quiz you on this, but there was a lower, lower overall, the low remission rate as there is in general in uveitis, you know, except for patients that are placed on cytotoxic therapy, which carries great risk. So 8.6%. And the factors that were associated with increased remission included prior protractomy. So like my patient Deegan, who had the protractomy, uh, um, um, seem to have a remission in that eye. And I think there is interest uh, in the UVI's community about uh, actually really studying that question, the role of therapeutic protractomy in uh, intermediate uveitis. I actually tried to pitch this idea 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's a really tough study to, uh, uh, to get to sell people on, uh, to the, at least to the must group. So it's on hold. Um, and I think it would be impossible to do as a single center type of study. Um, this paper also showed that a diagnosis with, you know, an early diagnosis, so that makes sense, right? So not so severe disease. Older age of presentation, we've been talking about that in terms of pediatrics. So kids with partial analysis usually have a poor outcome, uh, female sex and, uh, and Hispanic ethnicity. So prognosis in summary, you know, a, uh, a, a population-based study uh, by Donaldson showed a very good outcome, right? But in tertiary care centers, I think the experience is a little bit different. More severe end of the spectrum. Uh, they make up a larger proportion of pediatric versus adult uveitis. Um, testing should be guided, as I said before, about uh, you know by your history and view your system, so you don't order every test under the sun, um, and we'll talk about what we might, how we might choose tests and, and therapies for this disease. And then as a general rule, I mean, uveitis is, is difficult, but then it's easy at the same time. I think that your major goal is you want to rule out an infection. So you don't want to treat an infectious disease with steroids, right? So first rule of thumb is rule out an infection and then treat with immunomodulation with either uh, systemic or local therapy. And then the prognosis is good until it's not good, right? Uh, so Donaldson shows a good prognosis, but you know the, our experience with individual patients may be, may be different. So you can't really apply a population-based study to your the patient that's in the chair in front of you. And then pay attention to complications and treat them if they're site-threatening. So I'm gonna just go over a couple of cases. Um, of, uh, of parsimonious, uh, uh, intermediate type of uveitis. So this is a young woman 
Caucasian female complained of painless blurred vision and floaters for about 18 months. And the right eye was asymptomatic. She was a um, college student, uh, you know, usual, no high risk behavior uh, and uh, no unusual travel. Um, she didn't really have uh, any significant uh, past medical history other than uh, uh, family history of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So there's a family history of autoimmunity, low uh, pain in her lower back and knees and her left Achilles and a large cervical lymph node. So we're thinking about maybe, who knows, maybe she'll have, she has a stomach disease. And her vision was good in the right eye, okay, with one plus vitreous cells. So there was inflammation in the right eye, at least I, on, you know, on clinical examination. And the patient had some inferior uh, vitreous exudates. In the left eye, they were more obvious with poorer visual acuity and uh, more, more hazy view, right? And vitreous inflammation. So this is what a wide field angi angiogram showed. Anybody want to kind of describe that? Yeah, this is an angiogram of the right eye and uh, attention is drawn to the vessels in the periphery that show uh, staining, like perivascular staining and yeah. Okay, very uh, good. Staining for vasculitis. Staining and what else? Is it just staining? A little bit of leakage in the periphery, I would say. Yeah, but it's I think. Mostly staining. Right. So, and is the inflammation uh, just confined to the periphery? There are some vessels in the macula that are staining as well. I don't see a lot of staining at the disc. Right. Um, what time frame is this angiogram taken at? It looks like a late stage. It's a, it's a kind of a mid mid phase mm -hmm. angiogram. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, I think that's a, and uh, so what vessels are involved mostly? Mostly the larger vessels. Uh, mostly and the, the arteries. Large. It looks like a vein to me. Oh, yes, you're right. So, and in the left eye, this is the uh, later phase of the angiogram. Sorry, she also had involvement in the left eye with angiographic macular edema in late study. The uh, OCT, the right eye, showed no macular edema as the angiogram showed, but there is significant macular edema in this, this eye. So, differential diagnosis. So what category does it fly? Is this an anterior uveitis? Is this a pan uveitis? Posterior uveitis? Intermediate uveitis? It's a bilateral asymmetric intermediate uveitis with CME. Right, exactly. Excellent description. Okay, so we that's our differential. We want to make sure the patient doesn't have an associated systemic disease. And uh, we queried her for those things. We want to make sure she doesn't have an infectious etiology as well. Uh, the patient happened to be from the East Coast. We didn't test her for Lyme disease. Okay, so her uh, workup was unremarkable. That was ordered because I, she had this history of joint disease, back pain, and um, in a very small proportion of patients, uh, inflammatory bowel disease associated with HLA-B27 can be associated with uh, posterior uh, uveitis and sometimes an occlusive vasculitis. Then the question marks on all of these, right? Do we get a chest CT in, if she has normal chest CT? Is, is there an MRI? Do we need to get an MRI? Bartonella, she has no exposure really. Uh, UA, urinary beta-2 microglobin. Uh, there are no multifocal diseases or Lyme disease. So, you think about those things and you base, you know, the selection of those tests on your clinical suspicion. So inflammatory infectious workup were unrevealing, no evidence of inflammatory arthropathy and rheumatologic evaluation. Okay, so this patient now has a diagnosis of pars planitis, right? Um, young woman with a diagnosis of pars planitis, you want to ask her about neurological symptoms, right? So you want to ask her about numbness or tingling in her fingers, uh, weakness, bowel or bladder incontinence, 
certainly a history of sudden visual loss associated with optic neuritis. Okay? She denied those things. So an MRI was not obtained in that, this particular case. So the treatment options, what are the treatment options here? What would you, what would you treat this patient with? She has, um, you could consider like periocular steroid, but because she had uh, leakage on FAM, both eyes and evidence of inflation, she probably needs just systemic steroids. Yeah, so I would agree with that approach. I, you know, and a lot of the treatment decisions are based on, you know, the patient and their preferences. The twenty-year-old dancer, you know, ballerina, and I. And you have to also get the patient to buy into the treatment, right? So those are those are the uh, options. And she didn't tolerate oral prednisone for very long. That was the initial choice, and so she underwent multiple periocular injections uh, followed by dexamethasone implant and actually did pretty well, okay? On her examination, she didn't have complete resolution of periphobitis, but it certainly improved and improved significantly in, in the left eye. The macular edema also resolved with some ellipsoid disruption, but no significant decrease in vision. This is a, another case I, of, I, that Dr. Shakur had followed for approximately 10 years and uh, Rachel Patel uh, brought to my attention. Um, 26 year old woman who I uh, gave, had presented about 10 years ago, gave birth um, and developed decreased vision in her left eye with floaters. She underwent an unre unremarkable laboratory workup on the outside and was started on oral prednisone. And on presentation had 20 20 visual acuity. Phrase vitreous haze, no macular edema, an inferior snow bank and a few vitreous snowballs. So this patient comes in treated, worked up, and on examination looks pretty good. Right? Angiogram is, I would say, pretty unremarkable in terms of vasculitis in both eyes. Prednisone was tapered to off. Nine years later, she was followed up. An OCT looks pretty good, good vision. Ten years later, she represents with decreased vision in her left eye, anterior segment cell in her right and left eye, vitreous haze in the left, and had recently been on uh, prednisone from per her ophthalmologist in, in Nevada. So a recurrence, right? You can see here this area of I, uh, you know, what looks like retinal lightning. But uh, is vitreous condensation. Her angiogram shows diffuse, I think, capillary leakage in the right eye. What do you think about in the left eye? Same. Maybe some non perfusion out there or blockage. What is that? So she has some angiographic macular edema, right? Optic nerve head swelling. OCT shows definitive macular edema in her left eye and not her right eye, similar to the previous case. Additional workup was performed, which was non-contributory. And it was recommended that the patient start prednisone and as well as methotrexate. So why would we start methotrexate in this patient? Anyone? Why would that be a recommendation? Remember, there are no hard and fast rules or, or anything. You know? So you have a young woman, right, who uh, you know has previously responded to prednisone, uh, and you know, in at least in my mind, you get one shot at. A steroid taper, I would prefer not to have patients on multiple steroid tapers. So we would want to place her on a steroid sparing kind of regimen so that she doesn't develop recurrence. I'll give it, granted it was 10 years later. So she deferred methotrexate, but we tried uh, prednisone. Okay, so some discussion points to see how we're doing on time. 
Okay, so in a young female patient with parsonitis, when would you, uh, do you need to order an MRI on everybody? Yes or no? No. Okay, so why? What would, what would, what would kind of make you want to investigate MS in a patient with parsonitis? When would you order the MRI? If they have symptoms or a history that's consistent with demyelinating disease. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, and you know, family history may or may not be important uh, with respect to that. I would say on exam, if it looks like they have some like optic neuritis or right. like a lot of paraphlebitis. I think that's a very good point. Um, okay. So really signs and symptoms of MS and severe vasculitis, I think would, would make me want to do that. Okay. What um, are the factors in, in, in uh, recommending systemic versus local therapy? What do you what do you, what would do you have to consider in recommending systemic or local therapy? Another way of asking that question: Who would be an ideal candidate for local therapy? With intermediate UVS. Unilateral. Uh, okay, right. Unilateral disease with. I, I mean, unilateral, say, say they have a vitreous floater, are you gonna treat them with that? Do they, is there something else that you might see on exam that might prompt you to inject steroid in or around the eye? Macular edema. Yeah, right. Okay, so a structural complication, visually significant inflammation, asymmetric or unilateral disease. Okay, we use a periocular and intraocular treatment primarily in that uh, setting and also as adjunctive therapy, patients that develop macrodema who are on systemic therapy. Great, okay. So with respect to local therapy, you know, um, you know, we've kind of talked about this, you know, what, you know, factors uh, would, you know, when would you give it a intravitreal or periocular corticosteroid? So symptomatic, right? Presence of macular edema. Sometimes uh, periocular corticosteroids can be effective in patients that are complaining of uh, vitreous floaters that may be in which they do not have macular edema and they have good vision. Uh, it may, um, it may work well for uh, you know six months or or thereabouts. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that in some patients that have uh, non-central you know macular edema that may be uh, abutting the fovea or paracentral foveal cysts, so they they have something happening, right? And if their angiogram, if it's unilateral disease and their angiogram doesn't show significant you know, uh, zone one type of leakage, a, a subtenance catalog may be useful. Um, so when would you consider immunomodulation for a patient with parastinitis and what would be the best initial choice of therapy? When do you consider IMT in this setting? I just showed you two cases So it's a judgment question, right? So what factors would make you want to treat the patient systemically? And what would make you want to add immunomodulation? Anyone? So if you think that it's gonna be fairly chronic course or they're not having a great reaction to steroids or have complications, diabetes, et cetera, I would think about trying to transition over. Right, okay, so I think that's that's one consideration, right? So their prior treatment history is important, right? Whether or not they tolerate steroids or not. Um, what about the laterality of their disease, right? They have bilateral disease, right? In which they have already had a course of systemic corticosteroids and have had a recurrence. 
you might want to offer them immunomodulation, right? What about the patient and what drug would you choose? What category of drugs? All those drugs that we talked about. Usually an anti-metabolite, methotrexate. Right. First yeah, choice. sure. Anti-metabolite, I think that's, that would be good. What would be the second line therapy? If the patient does has recurrent inflammation or macular edema uh, or uh, vasculitis with methotrexate or with salsa, what would you advance them to? Would you go forward with a biologic? You would. And what biologic might you, what class of biologics might you choose? Maybe like Humira or one of the TNFs. And what would you do for sure before you uh, embarked on such therapy? Rule out TB. Anything else? So 15% risk uh, at five years with HLA-DR15, right? Do an MRI of the brain. Yes, I would, in this case, I would do an MRI of the brain, okay? For patients that, in whom I'm considering IMT with uh, anti-TNF inhibitor, for sure, okay? So, you know, quantifier and gold, obviously, and uh, or will I TB and MRI of the brain, good. So when do you consider laser product coagulation or cryoblation for parsimonitis? Vitreous hemorrhage, detachments, um, traction of epiretinal membranes. Okay. Um, anything on fluorescent angiography that might persuade you to laser? Have you seen some NV? Okay. Yeah. In the presence of ischemia, right? Okay. In the presence of non perfusion. Exactly. Uh, neovascularization of the uh, of the parse plane of snowbank would also be something that I would think about in terms of cryoblation. What about the presence of a mesoproliferative tumor? I know it's pretty uncommon. That would also be something I think about using cryoblation for. Okay, we. I kind of I I asked you this question already. The treatment options for the treatment of neovascularization and parse planitis. The test that would help you decide would be by the force, wide field force and angiography. I think that, you know, that's an important point in that you want to make sure that you're treating, um, you know, an ischemic uh, neovascular disease with appropriately with uh, either anti-VEGF or, um, or laser product coagulation. But in some cases, uh, neovascularization can be completely inflammatory. And in the absence of ischemia, may melt away with appropriate anti-inflammatory treatment. Then, what factors you know would prompt you to recommend the trachea inhibition with intermediate UVI or parsimonious? I think they have a lot of symptomatic floaters that are refractory to your treatment. But they have a lot of what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. They have like a lot of symptomatic floaters and stuff that are refractory to treatment that um, causes a lot of vision. Okay. Before you perform a vitrectomy on a patient with symptomatic floaters, you might treat them, right, uh, medically. Uh, what would be uh, a more immediate consideration for performing a vitrectomy in a patient with intermediate UVI? Hemorrhage or detachment? Yeah, right, exactly. So it's structural complications that would immediately affect vision, such as, such as a vitreous hemorrhage or, um, you know, a final uh, detachment, exactly. Okay, and then we discussed the fact that it may or may not be therapeutically advantageous. Okay, so intermediate uveitis and parsonitis in essence, non infectious intermediate uveitis. Parsplenitis can be treated with either with a lot of treatment options depending upon a variety of factors, right? Local or systemic steroids, immunomodulation, or some combination thereof. And not every eye needs to be treated uh, uh, to maintain good vision. The key factors in choosing therapy include the laterality, 
right? And the choice of therapy, the type and severity of inflammation, you know, uh, ocular medical comorbidities. So, you know, patients with uh, brittle diabetics might be better candidates for local therapy um, and steroid sparing therapy. Uh, the presence of an underlying systemic inflammatory disease. Obviously, you want to treat a disease that's going to affect the patient's health, right? Such as sarcoidosis and patient preference, as we have seen. You know, some patients just don't want to be on steroids. And I think that needs to be respected. Then multiple sclerosis should always be considered in young patients, particularly female patients with uveitis. And something that we haven't touched upon too much in the differential diagnosis, but that one of the very important masquerade syndromes to consider in patients with intermediate uveitis who are older uh, is primary vitreoretinal lymphoma and primary intraocular lymphoma. So you need to think about these masquerades um, always in these patients. Okay, so I'm gonna push on here. We're gonna move away and get further back into the eye. We still have a little bit of time left to talk about some congenital infections. Okay, so we kind of touch on that. What congenital infection would you diagnose here? It's like toxo. Yeah, right. So most congenital toxoplasmosis, quote, congenital toxoplasmosis presents as a macular scar, unfortunately. So congenital infections include the torch group, right? Others, you know, rubella, CMV, herpes simplex, okay? And then, you know, there are some really weird others here that have been uh, recently described and then there are emerging infections that we'll kind of discuss a little bit. So just a word about congenital ocular toxoplasmosis. Um, you know, the transmission is directly related and the severity inversely related to gestational age. Um, and that, I, you know, almost 40% of patients, you know, have, uh, with primary maternal infections have congenital disease. And that 70% of these manifest as ocular lesions. So the triad of congenital ocular tox toxoplasmosis, chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, Intracranial calcification. This is an unfortunate girl with hydrocephaly due to congenital toxoplasmosis, and you can see these calcifications periventricularly. Um, there's been kind of a paradigm shift in the in the thinking about you know uh, toxoplasmosis, and that most toxoplasmosis was thought to arise from congenital infections, but these days we think that. Um, uh, it, most of the toxoplasmosis we see are acquired uh, postnatal infections may represent the most significant proportion of these disease. This has you know, important, important public health implications in terms of primary prevention for both the mother and the children you know, preventing disease. Just the things that you need to remember about congenital toxoplasmosis is chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, and intracranial calcification are the cla classical triad. And there can be subclinical development of posterior involvement, okay, in a significant proportion of eyes, right? 85% develop chorioretinitis after three and a half years. Um, you know, the diagnosis uh, of congenital disease is, uh, you know, the presence of IgM or IgA, okay? Uh, a negative IgG helps rule out the disease. And PCR may be useful in patients with really significant inflammation. The treatment indications for congenital disease is antiparasitic therapy for a year, okay? For one full year in that uh, uh, situation, given this, uh, the fact that, you know, 85% of patients will develop chorioretinitis after three and a half years. So how do you treat congenital disease? Antiparasitic therapy with full antitoxoplasmic therapy. Older children are treated for the indication similar to adults. You know, macular optic nerve threatening lesions, visually significant detritus, and immunocompromised patients need maintenance prophylaxis. 
I'm not going to dwell on this as it's going to be reviewed uh, or in the infectious or has been in the infectious UBIs, but the classical treatment is, is triple therapy, pyrimethamine sulf sulfatizing and folinic acid. This is incredibly difficult to obtain and very expensive. Um, corticosteroids can be very useful at uh, a reduced dose in patients with um, uh, inflammation that's significant, but usually only after the initiation of anti-parasitic uh, therapy. One would avoid a periocular injection or intravitreal injection in any infectious kind of disease, particularly toxoplasmosis. Then alternatives include intravitreal clindamycin or systemic clindamycin, uh, Bactrim, Zithro, Topoclone. So just want to bring your attention to some of the other uh, other categories of uh, congenital infection. This kind of looks like a chororetinal inflammatory disease, not dissimilar to toxoplasmosis. Any Grateful Dead fans out there? Well, that's Bob Weir. He uh, was a rhythm guitar player for the Grateful Dead and his first big song was The Other One. And um, anyhow, it's an interesting documentary if you're interested in the dead. Um, the other uh, that, uh, virus is lymphocytic retinal meningitis virus, CLMV, okay, which is almost clinically indistinguishable when you look in the eye uh, to congenital toxoplasmosis, but it is a different entity entirely. And it's an, uh, caused by a single-stranded RNA virus and produces symptomatic maternal illness in about two-thirds of the cases with vertical transmission uh, during episodes of maternal viremia. And it's diagnosed serologically. Um, the systemic findings are, are not completely different, but you know, macrocephaly, hydrocephalus, neurological complications with seizures. Um, and the ocular findings include choroidal scars, as I mentioned, that are very similar to that seen in congenital toxoplasmosis. Uh, and it's differentiated serologically from toxo uh, and by the pattern of the calcifications, uh, which are diffuse uh, in toxoplasmosis periventricular and LCMD. Other infections. Um, this was uh, a infection that uh, has become a very important congenital infection worldwide, uh, particularly in the Southern hemisphere and uh, um, produces this type of maculopathy um, and can produce congenital uh, a congenital birth syndrome. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what this might represent? Another viral infection. Is it Zika? Yeah, Zika, exactly. Okay, so single stranded flavivirus, mild flu like illness. Congenitally, congenital infection can produce these kind of Accurate colobomas with their torpedo maculopathy and uh, iris colobomas and strabismus. There's really no treatment uh, for that, uh, unfortunately. Um, so, just going to throw out a couple of quick cases for you. Four year old painless unilateral decreased vision, four years old, right? Unilateral painless decreased vision, leukocoria and strabismus. So you're thinking differential diagnosis of leukocoria, right? And that's what you're that's what you see when you look in the eye. What what are you thinking of in terms of your differential diagnosis? What would be the primary differential? Retinoblastoma. Okay. That's one. What about infectious diseases? Like a toxicara. Like a what? Toxicara. Yeah, toxicara. Okay. So that's what this actually represents. So ocular toxicariasis. You want to tell me about the ocular toxicariasis, some, someone? So kids with a history of PICO or contact with puppies, there are a couple of forms of it, visceral. Um, larval migraines and ocular uh, larval migraines, 
It's usually unilateral, 90% of patients. And there are basically three presentations. There's this form with the macular, I, I, with the macular disease, and there's a, a posterior presentation. And then there is one with the peripheral granuloma with a typical vitreorenal strand uh, to, the, uh, to the optic nerve. And then in older children, it may, may present with, um, as, a, as an endophthalmitis. It's diagnosed clinically by looking in the eye, but also serologically. Uh, and ultrasound is very important uh, in excluding, uh, you know, uh, calcified lesions and retinoblastoma. So the most important differential someone had mentioned for ocular toxic arise is the most important thing to exclude in this age group would be one. You've already taught, you've already said it. Sporadic unilateral blood, retinoblastoma, right? But there are other things that it could be, endophthalmitis, toxoplasmosis, and then there are retinovascular diseases, particularly in the um, form that presents with particular with uh, peripheral disease. Uh, the treatment is uh, usually there is no really unified uh, consensus on the treatment of this disease in terms of uh, medical therapy. Uh, with anti-helminthic disease, although albendazole is frequently used, um, periocular and systemic corticosteroids for eyes with severe inflammation, and vitreoretinal uh, surgery for patients that develop structural complications such as tractional detachment. Here's a, another case that was instructive, a 15-year-old female with a history of congenital CMV. So she has congenital CMV, but uh, um, and some complications of that with two key history of photophobia and blurred vision. Uh, her past medical history, she has hearing loss and developmental delay due to the congenital CMV and, her, and a history of uh, panuveitis in the fellow eye, not the presenting eye, with a retinal detachment and LP vision. And her vision in the affected eye was down at 2060, normal pressure, anterior chamber, and vitreous cell, okay? It was very instructive to look at her fellow eye, so because this can tell you, you know, something about what you're dealing with in the other eye. So here you see a patient with, you know, PVR and uh, fibrotic uh, peripheral retina and really um, necrotic peripheral retina. So I'm thinking, man, I hope this patient doesn't have, you know, a uh, acute, disease in that eye that we have to treat. Well, you have to think of an infection, right? So this isn't really that typical of one might see, you usually don't have a reactivation of a congenital CMV, right? So you, um, but this lesion made me I think, well, maybe it's just toxoplasmosis. We have to think about that, looking at it. But then we saw some peripheral retinal whitening in this area. So our differential diagnostic consideration given the appearance of the other eye, you know, panuveitis, retinal vasculitis, and papillitis and retinitis in the left eye, with a history of PVR and retinal detachment in the right eye. She was worked up, which was kind of negative, but the number one thing that could, get, I always try to think of the thing that could really destroy the eye, what would be your one and two kind of differentials in this child that you would want to exclude. It can occur in children. Arn? Yeah, right. Necrotizing, Born. exactly. Necrotizing, uh, you know, herpetic retinitis. Okay. These other infections are also possibilities, and we would exclude those. Non-infectious diseases, not as likely, but possible. So here she is. Next steps. She did an EUA. Uh, her labs were negative. She had an AC tap and injection of intravitreal gancyclovir and a positive test for BZD. So, a IV acyclovir, intravitreal gancyclovir, and phoscarnate and prednisone and laser barricade at day uh, 13. So, she currently, I see this patient now yearly and is doing well with excellent vision. Uh, but you know, uh, you have 
And some, I, the thing that was instructive for me in this case was the fellow I, and, think, and of course, thinking of the worst possible thing this child could have. So I'm not gonna go through the diagnostic criteria. Uh, this, you, will, you will hear about this already, but it's really a clinical diagnosis, a retinal necrosis, rapid progression, circumferential spread, spread occlusive vasculopathy, and, and prominent inflammation. So it, you make the diagnosis by looking in the eye and then perform uh, either an anterior chamber or vitreous biopsy to confirm the diagnosis and treat them at the same time. So you don't wait for the result. Here's a 12 year old male from Idaho, unilateral recurrent multifocal cord retinal inflammatory episodes with scan vitreous. I swear there's some kind of weirdness that goes up in Idaho, but there's something in this person's retina that's unusual. It's highlighted here. Does anybody see that? Dusen. Yeah, Dusen, right. So there's a, there's a worm here. And then when you show light on this area, the worm would move. Okay, so this is diffuse subacute unilateral neuroanalysis. It's pretty uncommon here, a lot more common in the Southwest United States. Nematodal infections, toxocara and, and two, uh, and the belly ascarids. Uh, the uh, raccoon worm and ankylostoma cranium in the Southeast and Caribbean. That's what it looks like on EM. The important thing to know about this is the presentation. It's usually unilateral. And depending upon the age of the uh, of time of the disease, it can look very different. So in the early, early presentation of the disease, it can look like a white dot syndrome. And you have you know, a worm that just migrates to the retina and just kind of destroys the retina. And in the late, it can look like a post-traumatic or an RP. So this is too late, right? So you want to identify the cause of the disease, at least think about it in a, in a person with unilateral uh, white dots uh, with inflammation. And the treatment, well, you want to burn the worm, okay? That's the treatment. And certainly you'd want to get the worm, wait until the worm gets out of the fovea. Albendazole may be helpful in, uh, in killing the worm, but in slowing the worm down, you know, and stunning them. So that they, if once they reach an area that's safe to laser, one can do that with impunity. I just want to review things that you guys probably already know and are consulted, you know, mercilessly. Uh, immature, immunolog immunologically immature neonates and hospitalized children, uh, immunosuppression, you know, important pathogens, candida, pseudomonas, staph aureus, haemophilus. Um, usually there's an underlying focus uh, or systemic condition, extraocular focus or underlying systemic condition. And the most important thing to exclude is retinoblastoma um, with no apparent infection. This is an eight-year-old, we only have a couple of minutes left, that presents with uh, unilateral painless decreased vision, cervical adenopathy, mild fever, and a new pet. What do we have here? Cast crash disease. Cast crash disease. Okay, neuroretinitis is what you've got. You don't know that it's cat scratch disease, but that's actually a good thought. Okay. So neuroretinitis for sure, because they have a pa partial macular star. Most, the most common diagnosis would be Bartonella species with cat scratch, but there are other considerations, uh, other infectious considerations that you need to exclude. Uh, it used to be called idiopathic or labors, idiopathic stellate neuroretinopathy, uh, but many of these cases are now thought to be um, Bartonellosis. There can be idiopathic disease with recurrent attacks. Um, I'm not going to go through this too much, but I think that uh, it's important that many of the, the history is important. So they, there's usually a flu-like illness with regional adenopathy, particularly at the site of the cat scratch, if they have cat scratch disease. Um, they can have a disseminated infection with fever, myalgia, and ophthalmologists. 
Uh, ocular disease includes paranoid ocular glandular syndrome, neuroretinitis, and one can also develop retinitis, choroiditis, and multifocal retinitis. That's important to remember and to exclude because one sees that in Bartonella infections, which you can see here. Okay. There's no definitive treatment guidelines because most of the time these children do well, but if you need to treat them, doxycycline, cipro, or azithromycin in adults, or azithromycin or trimethoprim with or without rifampin in children because of concerns of you know, uh, problems with teeth and doxycycline. Finally, uh, we have a 16-year-old hiker uh, with, with a photo of her rash. What's this photo? This is the diagnosis right here. Erythema migrans. Erythema migrans, right. Diagnostic of Lyme disease. She's relocated from the East Coast. Uh, Borrelia, tick-borne disease. Uh, it's always important to ask about it. I don't test many people for this unless they have a very strong history due to this bug, Isodes species. It, it is a spirochetal infection with systemic diseases similar to that of syphilis early disseminated and persistent disease with uh, the ocular manifestations varying depending upon the stage of the disease with a follicular conjunctivitis in the early stage of the disease. Intermediate is the most common presentation of disseminated persistent disease and keratitis with, pers with persistent disease. Uh, um, it is a clinical diagnosis, but we need supportive serology and PCR and currently is recommended that there's a two-step process, both um, immunofluorescence or EIA and then Western band with, uh, uh, with uh, confirmatory uh, Western blotting. Uh, masquerade syndromes, sorry uh, for going over a little bit here, but again, if you have a patient that presents with a pink hypopion, you wanna think about it, you know, an AML or acute uh, leukemia, retinoblastoma, and then these other masquerades, including endophilitis, GXG, post-transplant, intraocular foreign body, and uh, primary central nervous system lymphoma. I wanna thank Rachel Patel for helping me with the intermediate uveitis section. It was a pleasure to review that with you. And then of course, my kids for uh, the inspiration of pediatric UVS. I hope this was helpful to you and moly enough for you. Any Thank questions? You. You're welcome. Thanks, Dr. Vitale. You bet. Thanks. I think we reviewed all the uh, intermediate UVI study guide questions and everything, so. Uh,